welcome back to the Bitcoin layer. I'm Nick Batia, and today I have a very special guest for you guys, TXMC. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Nick. Been looking forward to this. All right, TX, why don't you tell the listeners and the viewers a little bit about yourself? Um, I know you from Twitter and from charting, uh, and I am a fan of your work, but tell everybody a little bit about yourself, please. Sure. Um, well, I... <clears throat> My main job is, uh, you know, I just produce reports and dashboards for um, a team of developers whose job is not to think about data. So uh, I have a background in analysis and, and conveying ideas from data to people who don't think about those things. And, um, you know, over the last couple of years, I started really investing in um, learning about the fin learning about the financial system, monetary history, kind of where our place is in those things. Um, you know, in the wake of COVID and all of the insane, like borderline insane uh, monetary and fiscal policy that came out of that, um, that entire crisis there, it, it really showed me that we were in a kind of a transformational era as far as money and finance goes, or at least it feels like we're at the top of a mountain of a big cycle. And so I just really wanted to understand those things. It led me to Bitcoin. It led me to learning about sound money and debasement and the destruction of buying power. And, um, you know, I started posting about those things that I was learning about, exploring on Twitter. And um, I don't know, it's it's led to me producing content on my own about those things now. It's just been, it's been a fun journey, mostly driven by learning and the desire to understand what the heck is going on with the money. All right. So instead of waiting till the end to plug your own outfit, plug your own outfit for everyone. Tell us what your handle is. Tell us your the name of your YouTube channel and the content of what you're delivering to your readers and your viewers. Sure. Love to. So uh, I'm TXMC is my alias. You can find me on Twitter at TXMC Trades. And I have a YouTube channel and a corresponding newsletter that go by the name Alpha Beta Soup. And on my videos, which is where I started making content originally, I was making videos before I had a newsletter. Um, it's, it's really my attempt to explore what's going on in the markets on a, you know, not too zoomed in time frame. I'm not trading the markets every day, but I am trying to understand them and kind of directionally project what I think is going on in the big picture. Uh, I try to explain things in, you know, easy to understand ways. And I build a lot of my own custom charts and we just try to walk through what's going on in the world. It's it's a way for me to explain things to my audience and hopefully they can learn all, as well along this, uh, along the way as I'm trying to, um, you know, form a thesis about what I think is going on. So most of my content is around explaining the macro situation, explaining Bitcoin, uh, what all these different moving pieces are and how they relate to each other. Great. And I know you're a reader. You recommend books uh, that you're going through as you're going through your own learning process, which I think people really appreciate because we love Twitter in its short form dialogue, but real learning is not possible without the longer form content. So I've seen you recommend uh, Dalio's book on debt. There's another mm -hmm. book that you recommended called A World in Debt. Tell us about a couple of those books, uh, maybe what are some of the books that you've found foundational in your overall macro approach? Maybe even answer the question, do you consider yourself a global macro student or a Bitcoin student or both? Kind of what type of student do you consider yourself? And then what content or uh, material did you read on Bitcoin that sent you down that rabbit hole? What did I read about Bitcoin? Yeah, so I do read a lot. I try to read uh, as often as I can. I try to read more than I talk. Uh, you know, I, I want more coming in than going out. Uh, so I, I do read quite a bit. Ray Dalio's book, Big Debt Crises, uh, was foundational for me. Uh, I, I recently reread it. I read it about a year and a half ago. Uh, and then I got the big fancy version, the coffee table book version that's got like all the cool uh, expanded charts and stuff in the back. Um, and so I reread it again this year. Fantastic book. Uh, that was really foundational for me because it helped establish in simple terms, in layman's terms, 
kind of the, the overarching cycle of finance, mostly the credit cycle. I mean, that's really what he's focused on. Um, and it helped me to kind of see the cyclicality of things. You know, when you see the events that played out in the Great Depression, you see what happened in 2008. There are a lot of similarities there. And you see those same kinds of cycles playing out in other parts of the world. So that was really informative for me. Um, but there's that book, as well as The Fourth Turning by uh, Neil Howe and uh, the other guy, Strauss. I forget their names. Um, a lot. It's, it's popular with a lot of Bitcoiners, and rightfully so. Um, that was really eye-opening for me. I think those those two books, I read that one for the first time earlier this year. And The Fourth Turning combined with Ray Dalio's Long-Term Debt Cycle, the kind of the marriage of those two concepts has really been uh, an inspiration for me and the way that I look at where we are in the monetary cycle, in the debt cycle, and what what course of events may play out in the future. I, I also have been reading a lot about ancient monetary history. Uh, like I've gotten some books on monetary history of China, which is some of the first experiments in paper money. And uh, I've found reading about that has been amazing in terms of setting the stage for what we're do dealing with in the 20th and 21st centuries, because we do the same things over and over again. It's just that societies aren't very good at remembering that. So I, I've really been going down that rabbit hole a lot. Um, in terms of what I read about Bitcoin, you know, I don't know if there was <clears throat> a single piece of writing that really kicked it off for me, but or one of the very first books I read was the Bitcoin Standard. Uh, and then I bought this book called Layered Money by Nick Batia. Uh, both of those I read in close proximity to each other uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, when I, right around the time I got on Twitter was around when I, when I was reading those books. And um, those those were really the foundation for me. And then I started finding other people to kind of provide supplemental perspectives. Lynn Alden has been really uh, foundational in terms of my learning, not just about macro, but how Bitcoin might fit into that picture. And as well, she takes the the approach of the longer term debt cycle and how all that marries in. So my the things that I had been reading led me to Lynn Alden kind of just naturally through gravity. And uh, I, I would say that your book, The Bitcoin Standard, uh, The Fourth Turning, and Dalio's Big Debt Crises have been four of the most important things that I've read in the last two years in terms of educating me and helping to fill in some of the gaps in my picture. You asked me if I'm, a, if I'm a, 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 an economist or like an econ student or a Bitcoin student. Uh, I, I'm a, mo a money student, right? And Bitcoin is money. And so uh, I, I started out learning primarily about Bitcoin and everything kind of blossomed from a central understanding of Bitcoin and a desire to be exposed to it and to understand it more because I think its potential in the future is kind of hard to quantify now. I think its importance to the human story has not been fully realized. Uh, and so all of those things kind of just make me a student of money generally, I would say. Thank you for sharing those recommendations. And let's talk about the cycle because I think that's what has attracted me to your work that you have this zoomed out approach to looking at things. And I appreciate your take of, or your cycle approach without the imminent forecast that that cycle that we are in right now is over or as is sharply ending. Let's just say, I think you're in the opinion that it's slowly ending or that we are in one of these turnings from one cycle to the next or one demographic, uh, existent to the next. So tell us what is your take on where we are in some of these longer term cycles and how imminent is the shift um, in your opinion? And what are some of the key things that you're watching? And I'll just layer in one more question that you can address throughout it. One of the things that everyone's talking about right now is whether the secular trends in the US Treasury market are over or if they are not. And the ones that think that's over have, you know, there are a lot of geopolitical takes in there with China and OPEC, uh, the de-dollarization of the China-Russia block. Um, then there's the other side of the coin, which is traditional asset managers have 
you know, hundreds of trillions of dollars. And a lot of those dollars will make its way into the risk-free asset, which is U.S. Treasuries. So the cycle plays in, the long-term cycle plays in there as well. What are your thoughts on these things? Good questions. <clears throat> I love talking about this cycle stuff. Um because there are the history rhymes. It's not just a cliche. It absolutely repeats itself over and over. The, the actors, the scenery changes, but the story remains largely the same. And that story is, the, at, at its core principles, that story is humans meddling with the money, right? And, and creating inequalities and imbalances in society that drive transformations, ultimately. And usually in a in a, in a violent way, not always violent to the downside, but in a, in a, in a, in a sense of upheaval, in upheaval, they create a violent transformation. I think when you look at, we'll start with the framework of the fourth turning, right? It, it, for those not familiar, it's basically an 80 to 100 year cycle, basically the, the length of a human life. And when you look across time, across human history, these cycles tend to play out. Now the, the book that, we're, that I'm referencing is very focused on American history, but these cycles exist outside of America. Uh, they really are societal cycles. And the belief is in this framework that we're in the kind of final phase of this current generation uh, that they call a saculum. And that the last stage is, you know, 20 to 30 years, roughly. And it's a period of significant upheaval, of transformation. Um, there's a lot of political strife. There's usually rising populism, a lot of political division between nations and within nations. Uh, and there's a lot of wealth inequality and a lot of misallocated capital, not just in single jurisdictions, but kind of globally. I think we can see all of those things happening. And the, the key point about the cyclicality of this fourth turning framework is that when you get to the end of it, there is usually a transformation. It's usually something that, you know, marks a generation. And usually afterwards, it leads to a period of prosperity. However, the actual transformation itself um, can, can be very volatile, for lack of a better term. The last ending of a cycle was Great Depression and World War II. And here we are about 90 years later, and we're going through a similar kind of sequence of events unique to our time where it seems like the, the cabin pressure is rising, right? And, and I think that a lot of it has to do with the chosen money of the world over the last 50 years, the U.S. dollar, the way it's been manipulated, um, the, the efforts that the U.S. has undergone to maintain its hegemony over the world. Um, and we've created a lot of inequality. And when I look at where we are in the cycle, when you see the busting of a 40 year bond bull market, um, I, I don't think that we're in some new regime of higher rates, uh, permanently, like some people believe, um, because the amount of debt we have built up through these decades of excess kind of preclude us from being able to enter a new higher rate regime. You know, there's like a cold reality of math that the, the government will run into, where they simply must create money to pay their obligations or all trust in their currency begins to deteriorate, right? Like they have to maintain good standing for their currency to underpin global commerce as it has. And so there's, there is a, a non-negotiable kind of singularity that we're heading towards. The question is, how long does it take to get there? What are the actions that the leaders take once we arrive there? How does that play out? No one knows. But I do believe that when you see these things play out over time, and you also see that human society manages to make its way through those strifes and come out on the other side, having learned a lesson and having reset the system in a way, I think we're heading towards one of those. I think it happens in our lifetime. But the thing I think maybe I'm not so sure of that that might put me on a, a different view from some other of my Bitcoiner friends is I'm not 100% sure that in the next decade of this current like fourth turning that we're in, I don't know that that's the end of the, the entire fiat monetary system. You know, I, I, th I think that this plays out a lot longer than people believe. We could have another generation, another multiple generations of the current system continuing to deteriorate and transform. Because when you look at like a, an accepted currency, 
something of the scale of the US dollar, which is what we're really talking about here, for that to be replaced takes the 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 mobilization of global inertia. Like there are so many jurisdictions, there are so many markets, businesses, countries, you know, funds that have chosen the dollar as their unit of account. They choose to import and export in dollars and it creates like a self reinforcing network effect. And so that is not uprooted quickly, right? It's either uprooted through the complete destruction of confidence in the currency, like what you saw in Weimar, Germany, uh, but or it happens slowly over time through the people just creating other, you know, sidecar systems like the BRICS nations talking about creating their own currency. Those things whittle away at the dominance of the dollar, but they won't individually, I think, topple the system. So my, I know I'm kind of going on here because I think it's important to kind of lay out all these pieces. I don't have a clear answer. I believe that the dollar is so embedded in the global system that it's not going to just simply be replaced by something else. I think it lasts for a while longer. But what you see at the end of cycles, what you saw in ancient China when they had their experiments with fiat money, and they ran up, you know, exorbitant debts like we have now. The people ultimately, not the government, but the people shun the currency and they start looking for other places to store their wealth because the currency dictated to them by the government, by the jurisdiction they live in, is no longer safe to protect their, their value into the future. They can spend it today, but tomorrow it's already been debased. And so I think that that's what Bitcoin has to look forward to. Bitcoin and other commodities. Commodities have always been the escape valve. Whenever there's been a destruction of current, of confidence in paper money, the people always have transferred to harder forms of money, to gold, to silver, to copper, even to silks, to rice, to things that have a real world production cost. And Bitcoin has that. And so I think that as we go through this transformation, the thing I'll end on is Whatever takes place over the next couple of decades, whatever that looks like, um, the actions that humans take, I believe, will be the same. But the new wrinkle is that there is an unconfiscatable digital commodity that now exists borderlessly. And I think that that is where Bitcoin's star begins to rise as fiat's begins to wane. And you talk about the embedded nature of the dollar and the network effects. And I think that is one of my main takeaways as well, that how deeply it is embedded is going to directly correlate to how long it's going to take to unwind. Yeah. And so, you know, part of the reason I started the Bitcoin layer is because I felt that that transition was going to be over my lifetime and something that I could write about for many, many years to come and that transition. So that's what we're doing at the Bitcoin layers. We're here to monitor that transition over the coming years or decades. And um, so thank you for your perspective on that. Let's talk about China. So have you read Mar the Marco Polo account of his experience with the paper money system during that, uh, during that era? That I've read a blurb about it, like yeah. a paragraph taken from his notes then. Yeah, so um, we might have read the same book on that. Talk talk about China now and the renminbi. I think this might be one of the reasons you believe the transition is not uh, coming in any short order because China and the Chinese renminbi is not positioned in any way to be the currency of mm -hmm. the world or even something that attracts a lot of network effect away from the dollar. So what... Uh, how do you think about China in your overall framework? Is it something, do you have a, you know, a newsletter or two that you subscribe to on China or a book or two that you've read recently? And how do you factor in China and Chinese economy to your overall picture? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I, I certainly don't know everything about China. Um, it, it's in large ways, it's a black box for me. I'm still learning about it. But I think that when I think about China, I think about the renminbi, the, the, one of the main reasons that it's probably not positioning itself to replace the dollar anytime soon is they have a closed economy. They don't, they don't want capital freely flowing in and out of their borders. You know, they want control over all those things. Uh, that's not the profile of a world currency. 
uh, certainly people who do business with China may keep some renminbi reserves. They may choose to transact back and forth a little bit, but for it to become a currency that is used in transactions for which China does not play a role, and then it, it, the, the profile of the Chinese government would need to change. And I think that considering the events we just saw last week, that's probably not about to happen anytime soon. If anything, they're going the other direction. They're becoming less friendly to outside capital, if I had to say. And, you know, the, the dollar for its part, like you mentioned, it's very embedded. And, you know, it's more than half of all world trade is denominated in dollars, to, regardless of who the two countries are. You know, if you look at imports and exports of different countries, just name a place around the world, most of them have the majority of their imports denominated in USD because that is what their trade partners require. It's what they request. It doesn't matter if the US is involved or not. Like India, for example, I think about 80% of India's imports are paid for in dollars, but the US only makes up about 10% of those. Uh, you know, you can, many of the US's largest trade partners use dollars in most of their trade, even though the US maybe only be 5, 10, 15% of their imports and exports, they use our currency. And that is the network effect. That's the thing you're trying to unseat. And it's been that way for decades and it's been rising. If you look at dollar usage in trade from like 2000 to now, it has gone up. It's very slowly. These things take a long time to change, but they're going up. It's going up slowly. The dollar is becoming more ubiquitous, not less, as we're, as we're potentially witnessing what we believe is the ultimate end of the current system. As we maybe see the light coming through the doorway on that, the dollar is gaining strength, not just the DXY is gaining strength, but the usage of the dollar. And you know, you can even study uh, there is a lot of research done on the pass-through effect of which currency is invoiced for trade and how that affects a nation's inflation. And when a country is heavily reliant on a foreign currency for trade, that country becomes extremely sensitive to exchange rate volatility and the inflation that is generated in the nation of origin of that currency gets exported to them at a higher sensitivity. And so when you think about what I just said, that so many nations have 50, 60, 70 or more percent of their trade denominated in dollars, many of these, most of these countries uh, are much smaller than the United States in size and exactly zero of them have access to our money printer. And so they have no release valve other than to try to tighten their own economies, right? And it's it, the the strength of the dollar and, and the, the policies we're now enacting are having an exponential effect on the rest of the world because of the usage of our currency and because they don't have the they don't have pricing power in much of their trade because it's our dollars they have to use to buy energy, for example, oil being the primary one. So I, I think that when you think about how deeply embedded the dollar is into every layer of commerce. I mean, firm financing in other countries is done in dollars. You know, people get loans from European banks in Asia in dollars. You know, Malawi is a South African nation. 90% of their imports are paid for in dollars from Asia. We don't even have anything to do with that. So th this, this system is going to take, I think, many years to be unseated. It won't happen smoothly. You know, we see what Russia is trying to do. They're trying to accelerate that process. Maybe they have encouraged it a little bit with what, with what we've seen this year. I think the West taking away Russia's FX reserves is also accelerating that process a little bit because it destroys trust in the old system. Uh, things like that, I think, will continue happening. But uh, as my rant just described, I think that we're probably some time away before the roots start actually being visible and we can see the dollar coming loose. So you're providing a rebuttal to the narrative of the death of the dollar. What about the narrative, the death of the petrodollar? Talk about the petrodollar for us. Explain what, how you see the petrodollar evolving? Is it going away? Is it still still here with us? And how does it impact this uh, global game of chess with dollars, treasuries, and uh, international players, and OPEC even? Right. Yeah, it's, 
it's difficult, you know, because what what uh, the, the petrodollar, you know, really started in the 70s uh, and the U.S. convinced Saudi Arabia and its friends to charge everyone dollars for oil. And, you know, in, in, in exchange, the U.S. would use its considerable military might to protect global shipping lanes and, you know, be the policeman of the world. That arrangement worked for a long time. Uh, but it, it, you can see the threads fraying now, and it's coming from Saudi Arabia, which is really the kind of the de facto leader of OPEC. Um, they very recently have kind of thumbed their nose at the Biden administration. I mean, he's he, he went there. Biden went there personally and asked them not to cut production. They immediately cut production. Uh, they announced further cuts than they even said when he was there. Uh, I think the U.S is losing its ability to threaten other nations and dictate their trade arrangements, right? I, I, th I think that we're kind of past that point. Um, it, 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 it didn't just happen this year, but this year certainly kind of showed the emperor's not wearing very many clothes in that regard. And I think that because, because of what Russia has done this year, they have shown, and this is kind of the Luke Groman thesis, uh, I take some of my cues in relation to how energy is paid for and what China's going to do from what the way Luke Groman looks at things, because I think he's he's really got his finger on the pulse with that. But when you look at what Russia did, uh, by they showed the world that it it isn't it's mostly about who has the energy that gets to dictate the terms, right? And energy and Russia is an oil dominant nation, a natural gas. They get to dictate which currencies their their goods are paid for in. Um, and I think that when we see the the energy crisis and the way it's spilling out of Europe, I mean, they may or may not enter a energy driven apocalypse this winter. I mean, a couple of months ago, it looked a lot worse than it looks now. Uh, but I, but I think that energy insecurity is going to drive nations uh, to make decisions that maybe a decade or two ago they'd be more afraid to make uh, decisions that would go against what the U.S. would prefer. Because energy is the most fundamental input to societal stability and abundance. It's the most important thing. More important than having a military, you must have energy. And so there are many nations who are energy insecure that have not been investing in long-term energy security. The U.S. is one of them. We are better positioned than most, but we haven't been investing in long-term oil production. There's a lot of other nations that are in similar boats where you're seeing capacity, production capacity slowing down or kind of capping out. Maybe OPEC is also reaching production limits. And those tensions will make it more important, more pressing for nations to make decisions they may not have made before. And uh, I, I think that when you have allies competing in an open global marketplace for the same resources that are critical for their industries, critical for them to produce more goods, to strengthen their military, to keep their lights on. Uh, it, it's going to weaken alliances. And I, it's it opens the door for other types, other units of account to be the primary unit for buying energy. Right? It's mostly been the dollar. Russia's dictating that people have to pay in rubles or possibly pay in gold. Uh, and depending on what the BRICS nations do, they may set up their own kind of commodity-based money. That's the Zoltan Pozar theory about Bretton Woods three, uh, where we go back to commodity based monies. And if you think about what we were just talking about a little while ago, the kind of cyclical nature of money generally, you have a period of money by decree. It is ultimately debased and meddled with by human authorities. They drive up inequality. They create an asset bubble. It crashes. People lose faith in the currency and they go back to commodities. They go back to the thing they trusted before the money by decree. And so I think we're in that phase. It's just a 21st century version of it. And it's happening at the sovereign level rather than at the individual level. Um, so I, I don't know what the end result will be. I know that the dollar is currently still the vast majority of global energy purchases are paid for in dollars, uh, but that is changing. And depending on where China decides to kind of aim their sales over the next few years, I think will influence the quickness of that transition. Because if they decide to be more overtly in support of what Russia is trying to do by kind of breaking up the Western system, then it will accelerate that, I think, certainly. And so talk about uh, energy inflation and 
the what Europe is going through right now and <clears throat> even the economics around the energy consumption of the world versus the available supply. Like we saw Biden go to Saudi and ask them not to cut. Um, what is your outlook in terms of inflation? And I know part of Luke Groman's thesis is that rates are going to go um, or that inflation is going to go back up um, over the longer term because of some of these energy dynamics. So explain to us what you think about that. Yes, uh, I hold that belief as well because, you know, energy, the demand for energy is relatively inelastic, uh, you know, relative to other things. Uh, and it's, it's one of those things that you can't just simply kill demand for and hope that it restores balance to the market the way you could with, you know, consumer discretionary goods. You can destroy the demand for televisions by making televisions too expensive and people will just stop buying them, but you can't do that with energy. So whole societies would shut down. And so when we, when we think about how there are nations who have not been investing in long-term oil capex because of either ESG concerns or, you know, Greenpeace initiatives or, or whatever the thing is, um, there's, there's been an, a neglect to future energy capacity and knowing that demand is relatively inelastic and knowing that some of these renewable um, inventions, wind, solar, um, et cetera, are not capable of replacing reliable baseload for sources of energy. It leads me to believe that there will be a point in the relatively near future. We're not there yet, but when you see how the strategic petroleum reserves got half of it already been taken out over the last couple of years, and we're not replacing it very well, and you see OPEC is struggling to keep their production up, uh, I think that we're going to he we're heading into a period of years uh, where energy is going to remain very volatile. There may be periods where it cools off, like we're seeing now. It seems like energy prices have topped, but in pure supply and demand, you know, from that perspective, the supply is not improving whatsoever. If anything, we're just using the strategic petroleum reserve to delay the normal price clearing effects of the market. Uh, and so I, I market a clearing effects of price, I should say. And so I, I think that, that that is a dance that can only be continued for so long. Sometime in the next year, they will have to stop draining the strategic petroleum reserve, or it will be at critically low levels that are unsustainable, that are bad for national security. And so what happens to the oil price? At that point, because if I just saw a report last week that global oil producers are like 50% behind normal CapEx investment at this point of their cycle. I saw that on Bloomberg. I might have that number wrong, but the point is globally oil producers have not been investing in the future. They're being told that they aren't the future, but we haven't replaced them as a, as a energy source yet. So I believe we will have volatile uh, energy prices. They'll probably go up again. Um, I, I don't really, I think what's going on in Europe is kind of a powder keg and it's an example of what may happen on a broader scale to the rest of the world over the next five, 10 years in different ways. If we don't either have a breakthrough in energy efficiency, some kind of scientific breakthrough, nuclear fission, something like that, um, or we have a renaissance where we actually invest in opening up more nuclear plants you know, expanding oil capex. These things have to happen, uh, and they're not currently. So I, I don't know. It's it's. I don't have to be an expert on the energy industry to just see that they're not creating enough supply for a thing whose demand is relatively infinite. It, the demand for energy is arguably infinite. If all of us could take a Concorde jet to work every day, we would. The only reason we don't is because it's too expensive. Right? It's not feasible, but we would if we could. And it's just because we don't have the energy mastery. But if you look at the rest of the world, if we just put the U.S. aside and, and put, put Europe aside, you look at, look at Africa, you look at parts of Asia that are lesser developed than China, these markets are up and coming. The, the energy use per capita is a fraction of what the West uses. Like the energy use per human being in India is a minuscule percentage of the amount of energy that you use or that I use as a Western citizen. And those nations are on the rise. And so their energy needs are only going to grow and ours are not going to necessarily shrink. 
And so I think that over these next few years, especially as those populations in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia continue to grow faster than ours, their demand is going to rise and they're going to put more tailwind pressure on energy prices. This th these things don't happen in a vacuum. And so I, I, all of that that I laid out kind of broadly just leads me to the belief that we're nowhere near the end of this, this saga as far as energy prices go. I, I think it could take several years before we climb out of it just because of how many years it takes to build up new production facilities. You know, these things take a long time and then they have to come online and then they have to build up production. So this is a, a multi-year process. So you're talking about the supply response. So when price goes up mm -hmm. due to uh, overwhelming demand and either flat or falling supply, it will put pressure upward on price. The upward yeah. pressure on price will bring new supply to the market. That new supply will take years to invest. Now put your cure for uh, high prices is high prices, right? Right, right. So put your uh, you know crystal ball prediction uh, hat on here. What is the supply response? You mentioned capex from the oil industry, or let's just say oil and gas. You mention technological breakthrough, which I'll give you a pass. Let's skip that one, and then yeah. uh, more nuclear facilities. So what? It, and even you can separate it by uh, region or country. What is the supply response? Because we are going to have one if we have sustained higher prices. Right. Well, part of the supply response relates to oil, right? And they need considerably higher prices in order to feel that it's worthwhile for them to invest. Because when you, when you look at the narratives around oil, they're not very encouraging, right? We're, they're being told they're not the future. They're being told that we want to divest from them as a society. If you make too much money, we're going to tax you even more. If you look at futures prices on oil two and three years out, they're only like $60 a barrel. So the, the market in every way possible is signaling to oil producers that they shouldn't bother. They should just sit on what they have now and see what happens. I, I think that I don't really know what all the different supply responses will be. You have started to see uh, some weakness in the um, the the what's the word I'm looking for? There is a resistance, excuse me, to nuclear power, right? And you're started to see those that resistance weaken a bit this year because of what's going on in Europe. Um, we saw in California they tried to shut down a nuclear plant; they decided not to. Uh, Germany was shutting down a bunch of them. They decided to pause on that. Belgium was going to shut down a couple. They did, but I think they're now starting to talk about maybe leaving a couple of them open. Uh, and I, I think that it's it's unfortunate, but a crisis is a great learning opportunity, you know. And I, I think that that we're that we have not always elected the best leaders. We don't. We're not always sending our best. And in some cases, it's a crisis that really. Uh, shines a light on what we need to do as a society to solve our problems. And you can't solve a supply-driven problem by killing demand. You can only solve a supply-driven problem really long-term by creating more supply. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have a clear idea of how we get oil production to increase other than exorbitantly high prices, which creates a significant slowdown in the economy. And you know, with the fragility of markets, makes me really concerned for, for what that looks like, you know, like wh what, what kind of, what kind of price leads to the kind of demand destruction that would slow down the markets like that? And could the market sustain high enough prices to encourage more oil production before we incur some nasty recession? Or like prices have to get up there and then stay there. Uh, I, I, there's so many moving parts here, Nick, it's really hard to know like which thing to focus on, you know, because a lot of the, problems with energy are really political in nature. They have to do with like infighting between the parties. There's a lot of special interests that drive the narratives at, at the political level. And those things have really, they've driven us into the crisis that we're in now, I would say. It, it's my opinion that ESG has played a massive role in why we have not been investing in oil production for the last few years. If you look at drilled uncompleted wells, which is a representation of future capacity. They're the wells that haven't been tapped yet for production, but they're in place. That peaked about two years ago. 
And it's just been going down ever since in the US. And until that starts to turn around, this situation is not going to improve. Uh, I don't know what brings that about, but the the old adage is that it requires higher prices. Um, but when we're sitting on the edge of a recession, higher prices might just be a spark on top of kindling. You know, it, it's hard for me to know which thing happens first. Well, let's change gears for a little bit. I want to talk markets. You are a chartist and a self-proclaimed degenerate. And the reason that you use the word with me is because you're comfortable in knowing you have a fellow chart degenerate uh, on the other side um, of the telegram. So listen, you and I, we are, we are, um, we see the truth in the candles and it's what, you know, it's part of what we do in terms of just waking up in the, in the morning and getting a sense of where we are. I'm sure you're looking at headlines and candles at the same time. So talk to us about your process. So you have your day job. You um, also have this passion for being a, mar a student of money and a student of markets. What, what do you do when you wake up? Uh, what does your trading view setup look like? And um, what what is your goal outside of your own education and maybe content delivery to people? I know you said that you're not actively day trading, but I'm sure your position's on. So what type of time frame? what type of asset classes? Talk to us about your approach uh, for portfolio management, really. Well, my portfolio is pretty simple. Uh, my portfolio right now is just cash and Bitcoin, um, and uh, I've had other uh, I've had other stocks and other things in my portfolio. But earlier this year, I consolidated most of those down, and I'm waiting. Um, my approach every day is uh, I usually read the news first. I've found that if I go to Twitter first, then that shapes my perspectives on the day, and I'd like to get a, a, my own opinions before I look at someone else. So I usually read Bloomberg and I watch Bloomberg in the morning because I like uh, the surveillance crew. I like watching Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramovich. But the, I, so I watch a little bit of TV, but I try not to watch too much. Uh, I usually I see what the headlines are on Bloomberg. I check Financial Times and then I mostly look at TradingView. I have a lot of data sources that I also update in the mornings for, like you said, a lot of the charts that I make. Um, but Really, the you know the things that I look at first in the morning, you know, the Bitcoin price. I look at two and ten year treasuries before I look at anything else. I look at the DXY. I look at S and P futures, the Dow Jones futures, and I and I, then I look at the the international markets that that happened before I woke up. You know, I look and see what USD JPY did. I look and see did the gilt market tank again, like it did a month ago. Uh, you know, I, whatever has been going on recently, that's kind of the second order of things that I look at. But first and foremost, it's always Bitcoin, treasuries, you know, oil price, S&P futures, that kind of thing. Um, my, I have a lot of different views in, in trading view. I, I save a lot of different layouts for things because, uh, you know, there's just too much stuff to look at. I, I try, I don't like to have one screen that's got everything. I tend to bounce around a lot. Um, but Bitcoin is always kind of the first thing I look at every day. Uh, not, not a lot has been happening to Bitcoin recently in terms of the price action. So, uh, sometimes my look is more brief than other times. Uh, but it, I, I most, because that is where, that's where my original passion for wanting to learn about macro and how all these things relate came from a desire to understand Bitcoin and how I thought it was going to perform in the market. Bitcoin is always kind of my center. And so that's what everything kind of blossoms out from there. I do look at some on-chain. Um, when the market is trending, I look at on-chain data more frequently. Um, but in the last few months, I, I hardly look at it at all. And, you know, I, it's really, where's the story? You know, recently, the last, most of this year, the story has been in the bond markets. Uh, so I, I, I've been doing a lot of learning. You know, when I came into the beginning of this year, I knew very little about the treasury markets and how they worked. But, you know... Necessity is the mother of invention. And so we're in the middle of a collapse of an historic bond market. So I'm going to learn about that shit. Uh, and that's been the focus of my year. Um, and, you know, as I suspect that as most of the bond sell off has probably happened, if I had to guess, the majority of it has probably already happened. Uh, I think that as we transition through this crisis, that maybe near the end of this year or earlier into next year, 
the narratives are more likely to start shifting to be about different businesses and institutions and entities across the spectrum struggling to refinance their debts and either facing default or insolvencies. And when that narrative starts to shift, there will be other things to look at, right? Maybe we'll pay a little more attention to what's going on with corporate bond spreads. You know, maybe we'll, we'll you know, be trying to follow bankruptcy news, things like that. So there's a there's a, 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 a top layer of like the premium assets that are kind of always relevant. But then after that, it's like, what's what's the current narrative? What's more important to focus on? What are people interested in learning about? And where can I like focus my my brain, my brain laser today to try to bring some insight? And I want to talk about something you said in your previous answer, which is there are so many moving parts. Uh, part of what we're doing at the Bitcoin layer is just explaining to our audience just how many moving parts there are. And if you are able to even absorb a few of them, you are going to be putting yourself in a better position, but it doesn't mean that you'll be able to absorb all of them. So it is a lifelong journey. And I think you're learning this too. Once you get a couple years into the global macro, global market scene, you realize how many topics there are uh, that others have mastered that unless you're able to absorb each one of these components, you'll never be able to get the full picture, right? So I'm lacking in my expertise in energy, for example, uh, you know, more of an interest rate uh, specialist. So, but energy is so important that unless you're understanding, you're probably going to miss something and miss part of the global macro picture. So um, that we identify a lot with that. And as students ourselves, we're teachers, but we're also students. We find that the acknowledgement of just how many moving parts there are is probably the, the greatest victory that you can have in this process because it'll keep you humble and keep you learning. And so yeah. you're, you're mentioning that part of the moving parts that you saw this year that was a blind spot for you was U.S. Treasuries, right? Um, not my blind spot um, because it's my background. I'm a U.S. Mm -hmm. Treasuries trader. And, uh, you know, it's the asset class that I'm the most familiar with, uh, aside from Bitcoin. So talk to us about your outlook on treasuries. You said that most of the sell-off you said is, you know, you feel is probably over. Um, you know, that does imply that lower rates are coming, um, for us, or maybe, uh, for us treasury rates over some time horizon. So I want to know your outlook on that. One thing that we're watching for is that when growth eventually does slow to the point where the Fed pauses, there's going to be a grab for duration and send rates lower. I have a big problem, though, TX, with the calls for 8% treasury yields that I'm hearing across the spectrum. It seems incredibly hysteric, and I can't wrap my head around it. So if, if it's part of your thesis that we'll either see those types of rates in this current little cycle or maybe in the next one as we're going forward the next two or three years, we'd love to hear that and hear you flesh out what do you think is going to happen to U.S. Treasury yields uh, specifically over the next six months and two years? Yeah, it, I do believe that most of the sell-off is done. You know, certainly they could go a little bit higher when I when I've looked across the the year here, you know, I know you 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 guys share the um, the two year versus Fed fund futures chart quite often because it's been a, a tell for the end of hiking cycles. It's been really accurate, and <clears throat> for a good part of this summer, it looked like three to three and a half percent was like as much as it could as it was able to price in for a while there. Uh, but just recently, there was another there was another move higher, and now when you look. At the Fed funds futures curve, um, it looks like through next year the market is currently really struggling to believe in five percent rates. You know, I, I think we're getting to a place where it's it. The market was clearly starting to believe the Fed because it created more room for them to hike. You know, the way that yields took off and the way that in their their 
hawkishness from Jackson Hole, the way that rates then moved high, or yields moved higher then after that. And since then, I think the market in a way started to believe that the Fed's going to keep tightening. We don't know how far they're going to go, but they are going to keep tightening. Whereas a year ago, there were a lot of people that believed they just simply couldn't. So I think that we've, we've seen some loosening there. But when you think about where the yields are now, I mean, everything is at like 4%, um, 4, 4.2, 4.5. When you think about it, we have $31 trillion of public debt. There's $300 trillion of total debt. Um, and then you think about, well, what if we maintained current interest rates at 3 or 4% for another calendar year? And a lot of that debt starts getting rolled at those new higher rates. The there's 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 an insolvency wall that the U.S. government's going to run into at some point because we're already running 10% deficits. And it's the, the interest expense alone on the U.S. debt is about the size of the defense budget right now. It was $400 billion last year. This year, it's closer to $700 billion. The defense budget is like seven fifty. Uh, I think interest expense this year, I believe, is around $680, $690 billion. I saw that in Bloomberg. There's a couple of different ways to count interest expense. And one of them is much higher than the other one. But the one I believe is accurate, it's about $680, $690 billion. And that is with just you know six months or so of higher rate policy built into it, right? It really started in like March. Uh, but if if you think about the average maturity on public debt is about 1.7%, something like that. If we sit at current rates for another year and we have, I forget, either, either you or Joe, I believe, posted the maturity distribution from the Bloomberg terminal. Uh, I think it was one of you guys. I saw it on Twitter the other day. Uh, there's a couple trillion dollars worth of debt that has to be rolled in the next year. And it, when it does at those higher rates, that's going to be a big jump in interest expense and it's going to just keep happening, right? And so that that framework is one that I don't see a lot of these TradFi people even acknowledging when they talk about a higher rate regime, about higher for longer, about how rates are going to stay at four or five, what you think you said 8%, any of those numbers, not one person that I've heard make that argument has then also acknowledged interest expense, the continual rising floor of interest expense and how those things are married to each other in reality. And if you look at like the the Congressional Budget Office outlook for interest expense, which they released at the beginning of this year with much lower rate policy, you know, in existence at the time, we certainly weren't in the environment we were in now, they were projecting that interest expense would exceed all other the, the rest of let me phrase this right. They believed that interest expense would exceed the remainder of the U.S. deficit by the end of this decade. And then I think by 2040, it's expected to be more than Social Security every year. And that's with low interest rates. You know, that's with like a 2% interest rate. So I, I think that we have to start really having a conversation because no one in the government is having this conversation. The Fed is not having this conversation. Uh, the president isn't. There is, a, there is a non-negotiable, as we said earlier, kind of cold wall of math that the government is going to run into with higher rates. And the only solutions at that point, because you see the appetite for treasuries, it's already diminishing in this high dollar environment from the foreign actors that usually help to provide and the primary dealers that help to provide the buying demand. It's already trickling away. If we continue to tighten and stay tightened for an extended period of time, that demand is going to diminish. So then the only remaining buyer for treasuries becomes the Fed. And so I, I, I think that that is not being acknowledged and that environment precludes lower rates. And so I think that there's, when I talk about the interest expense, that's a big reason why I don't think the rates can stay higher. Uh, the market doesn't believe that rates are going to be able to successfully get beyond about 5%. Uh, and, you know, the, the U.S. was bailed out a little this year because of a record amount of tax receipts because of last year. They had the, the tax receipt 
windfall of this year, like blew out all previous years. I, I don't know the percentage higher the, from the previous high, but on a bar chart, you know, it's going across and then it just shoots up for this year. They had a huge tax windfall and Yellen has worked to cut some spending. And so they, they're trying to extend this program of tightening as long as they can. Uh, but I believe that sometime in the next year, they'll be forced to abandon it, for a lack of a better word, uh, simply because there will be no one buying their debt but them. Yeah. And talk about the demand then for treasuries coming back into the market. Is there is there a source of demand uh, from abroad that you see it will come back in reaction to some of the demand that left the market this year because of the dynamics. So when it turns, it turns fast. It's something that we see in rates. Rates move really quickly. Mm -hmm. We've seen how quickly they've moved up. Could they move down with the same sort of speed if there is some sort of shift? Will it come from, uh, will it come from the Fed? you know, just signaling? Will it come from some other exogenous event? How do you see that playing out? And then if you could also weave in something that you said about the pundits that are calling for these higher rates aren't really talking about the mathematical wall, I would push back on that a little bit and just say that some are saying, actually, the interest expense getting so high guarantees QE, which is something that you mentioned as well in your answer, that it actually guarantees QE so that we don't have rates going out of control. And the guaranteed QE is part of the reason to be bullish on Bitcoin or some with the thesis uh, have a newsletter that are selling gold or uh, you know gold products, that type of thing. There, There's a lot of people in the gold camp as well as the Bit camp, Bitcoin camp that believe this is just a foregone conclusion that we're going to get QE infinity. I think QE is part of the framework, but the Fed is really trying to fight this idea that we're just going right back into QE. So where do you feel? I think that's one of the bigger debates that's out there right now. Yeah. And so the, the, the Fed is currently prevented from returning to the kind of QE that people are expecting uh, because of inflation. And because because if they were to turn back to QE, they would essentially be abandoning the inflation fight, right? You, you would be giving up on it because you'd be creating inflationary factors in the market. Now, we know that the Fed ran QE for many years and were not able to generate inflation. So it's not necessarily a one-to-one, -one, they turn on QE, inflation, it goes to the moon. But I think because of the environment that we're in, uh, and because of what happened over the last two years, that is very possible. And because because of the supply issues with energy that we talked about, because there's trillions of dollars sloshing around in the system waiting to be spent on something, right? That's just sitting in bank accounts. The, there is a high risk of accepting inflation for the long term if you pivot back to QE. So I believe that the Fed is probably going to resist it as long as possible. And there are other ways for them to create more demand for treasuries that they haven't explored yet. They haven't changed the SLR restrictions. They haven't lowered the rate in reverse repo. They haven't compelled pension funds to buy more bonds than they have in the past. Uh, they're, 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 they could still attack these different vectors to see if they work before they go back to becoming the buyer of last resort. They haven't done that yet. There's $600 billion in the Treasury General account. They could put that to use somehow, though that would be a pretty obvious tell that they were buying treasuries out of their bank account and we could see it whittling down. That's not the most sustainable strategy. But changing the SLR rules, that is a sustainable strategy. They haven't done that at all. They could raise the, the cap on what institutions are able to hold. They would then start buying more treasuries. They're, they could compel pension funds to buy a larger amount of them than they've had before. Uh, that's one of the things that uh, nations had to do after World War II in financial repression to deal with the exorbitant levels of debt then was keep, in, keep interest rates below the prevailing level of inflation and compel a certain 
part of the market to buy your government bonds through regulatory capture, which is kind of what we have now. Uh, it's what they also have in Europe. That's why you have so much exposure to the, with the pension funds, to the treasury markets over there. Those levers could still be pulled. And they may work to some degree in bringing some more demand back to treasuries. They could help lower yields. Uh, but I don't think that's the, what's the Fed wants just yet. But I do believe that that is one of the options they'll consider before they just quote unquote flip the money printer back on. Uh, because in March of 2020, when the Fed provided the historic stimulus response that we saw, the Fed at the Congress together provided the stimulus response that we saw, uh, inflation was 1.5% and debt to GDP was like 95, 100%. Now, debt to GDP is 125%. Inflation is four or five times what it was in March of 2020 on the low end. And in not just here, but in all of our, you know, allies jurisdictions as well. And, uh, so the, the QE pivot that is romanticized by Bitcoiners might not look the same that it looked three years ago, two years ago, because the factors surrounding the market are quite different. Uh, and what really triggered that response as well, which I, I, I try to point out to folks, is that what happened in March of 2020 was an utter market disaster, right? Treasuries went no bid in one freaking day. If you look at the move index, the, the bond market volatility index, it traversed the distance in two days that it has traversed this entire year as we have slowly been grinding higher on the volatility index for treasuries. We're now at the level that we were at in 2020, but in 2020, it did that in half of a week. You know, it went from zero to a thousand and the treasury market went no bid. The Fed was required to step in. The equity markets fell 35% in one month, in the month of March. They There was... There were two days in the middle of March when I was day trading equities. This was before, before I started becoming a Bitcoin content guy. I was day trading equities and they literally shut the whole stock market down. We had a market wide circuit breaker, which had not happened before. They had just implemented those rules a few years earlier, had never used them before. That happened for the first time and it happened twice in the same week. And it was utterly terrifying. And like, they shut down individual tickers all the time for volatility. They don't shut down the entire North American stock or you know, New York Stock Exchange. That's what happened. So the, those events led to an historic stimulus response from Congress and from the Fed accommodating it, which combined created all the extra money, all the inflation that we're now dealing with. So I, I, I impart upon people who discuss these pivot ideas to actually walk through in your mind what would have to happen similar to March of 2020 that would initiate a response of the same scale or greater, which they would need a greater response to create the same kind of effect. It would have to be an utter calamity. It would have to be something horrible. It would not just be that we'd wake up on a Tuesday and you know, there would be some repo rate spike and then they would dump a hundred billion dollars into the market like they did in 2019. Like they may do something like that, but that's not the kind of QE people are looking for. Uh, the kind of QE that, you know, it becomes a sustainable bid. Uh, I don't know what would it would take for that to happen, but I think because of inflation, the Fed is going to push back as much as possible and explore those other tools that we talked about before they go back to the kitchen sink approach. All right. Last question. Not financial advice, just a, a little bit of a prediction market. Next 500 points in S&P 500 and next $5,000 on Bitcoin, higher or, or lower. And I expect your answer to be the same for both, uh, but it might not be. I think we uh, have tailwinds in the near term. I think the prices will go higher in the near term. Uh, it looks like treasuries wanted to curl over a little bit. And then last week, we got that dovish, you know, those dovish comments from Mary Daly. Is it Mary Daly? Uh, at, on, on the same day that the Bank of Japan intervened in the yen. And I, so I think that there's some 
maybe not overt, but maybe some covert coordination going on between the US and Japan. Uh, and I would assume that they're having similar conversations with the UK. Uh, and I, I think that, that that the market wants there to be some, some tailwinds. And when you see those signals, I think it provides some room for them. And we just came out of a, an earnings season that really wasn't that bad, uh, all things considered. So yeah, I think in the near term, uh, up is the pain trade. But I, I don't believe that we're um, out of this saga yet. And my base case is still that at some point in the future, we will be lower. Okay, excellent. Well, TXMC, thank you so much for joining us here at the Bitcoin Layer. Viewers and listeners, go subscribe at thebitcoinlayer.com. Find everything we're doing. Uh, TX, why don't you lead us out and tell, remind people where they can find you? Sure. Highly recommend you guys go to the bitcoinlayer.com. I've been a member since Nick started. The, I, I don't know if I got on when you first started the newsletter, but I was definitely in there uh, uh, like a year ago, I think. Uh, so anyways, go sign up. You can find me on Twitter at TXMC Trades, uh, and you can find me on YouTube at Alpha Beta Soup. Um, if you'd like to read my newsletter, you can find the link in my Twitter bio, or you can go to alphabetasoup.io. Thank you for joining us, and we really appreciate your time. Thanks for uh, sticking with us here at the Bitcoin Layer for another episode. Thanks for having me, Nick.